Hello, welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, we meet young environmental activist Hong Yi Yu. Single life, China style, the rise of AI romance. And no stepping back, Taiwan and China continue to push rhetorical buttons. But first today, what are people talking about on the platforms they use? Joining me is Yvonne Yong. And Yvonne, a Weibo post on World Mental Health Day has highlighted a staggering statistic about China's adolescence. Hi Stan, more than 120 million people reacted to this hashtag. The detection rate of China's adolescents' clinical depression rate is 24.6%. The number comes from China's National Mental Health Development Report for the previous two years. On World Mental Health Day, the People's Daily said, depression is not just a bad mood, it's a disease. And the detection rate of depression among adolescents in our country is increasing year by year. It's normal, says one person. Person. Chinese schools never let students have enough sleep. Everyone is in a state without enough sleep. It's weird if people are not depressed. And this one is a reminder of how difficult it can be to address. The class next door has a kid diagnosed with depression, but the father said, it's not cancer, no one's going to die. That parent made me speechless. Now, the Greta Thunberg-inspired hashtag Fridays for future climate strikes was a call to young people around the world. And in China, one young woman, Hong Yi-u, stepped up. But it's come at a high price, with Howie, as she's also known, under a lot of scrutiny. As the world's greatest user of fossil fuels, China has made much of its commitment to contribute to a solution for climate change, as well as other environment causes. But unlike many other countries, the reform is not being driven by popular campaigns or the pressure of political opponents. Jinghua Chan looks at what some describe as China's authoritarian environmentalism. Remember when China stopped taking our rubbish? China used to handle nearly half of the world's recycling. But in 2017, the government banned importing plastic waste. Instead, it focused on recycling at home, rolling out an ambitious new system in 46 cities. The same year, with the goal of improving air quality, the government banned 28 cities in China's northeast from using coal for heating and cooking, something they'd done for generations. These are just two examples of how massive changes to environmental policy can happen almost overnight. But radical reform is not without risk. For instance, the recent power outages across China are partly due to local governments scrambling to meet new emissions targets. In China, the lack of uh, opponent parties give a strange benefit for the party to implement things rapidly and effectively. But on the other hand, it remains challenges. Why? Because uh, how, how can the supervisors be supervised? Dr Chen calls China's approach authoritarian environmentalism. It's almost the opposite of how we usually think about environmentalism as a kind of protest movement. Two, eight, two, four, six. Climate protests do happen in China, but they look less like that and more like this. And I was rejected from going back to school because of the activism. Bo Hong Yi started protesting when she was 16, inspired by Greta Thunberg's Fridays for Future movement. It is just as much about our present and future missions as it is about our historic missions. That's seen her questioned and detained by the police in both China and later Switzerland, but she says she has no regrets. While not a fan of protesters like Hong Yi, the government is promising action on the environment. 
，中国将力争二零三零年前实现碳达峰，二零六零年前实现碳中和。中国将大力支持发展中国家能源绿色、低碳发展，不再新建境外煤电项目。Environmental policy has become an important part of China's international diplomacy, and also a symbol of the country's development and transformation, from a dumping ground for first world problems to a source of green solutions. Five or six years ago, uh, China has been considered as a, back, a laggard state in terms of environmental performance. Under Xi Jinping's administration, the kind of direction has been changed. State activism uh, in promoting sustainable business such as wind power, solar power, or even nuclear power nowadays came considered as uh, new sources of uh, soft power. As an Australian, it's fascinating to see how this plays out in a country where there's no one really disputing the fact that climate change exists in either the government or the media. But while there's no climate skepticism, there's also not a lot of in-depth discussion of the dangers of climate change, even when people are feeling its deadly effects. Uh and Jinghua Chan joins me now. Jinghua, what do the Chinese people think about the net zero by twenty sixty target? I think that the average person probably doesn't have, you know, a strong opinion on whether um, China reaches net zero by 2060 or earlier. I don't see the kind of public debate that there is, um, for instance, on something like air pollution, where you can see that there's, you know, major public outcry demanding uh, better air quality. I would say maybe people's concerns are more practical than ideological. Yao Zhe, who's a climate expert with China Dialogue, writes actually that uh, people seem to understand carbon neutrality as a development strategy without necessarily uh, drawing the links between carbon neutrality and reducing emissions and uh, mitigating the effects of, of climate change and uh, things like natural disasters and, you know, the impacts on human life. So what more can you tell us about how are you? Uh, I found it really inspiring to talk to her, actually. In a way, she reminded me, I think, a lot of climate activists I've met uh, in Australia and elsewhere as well. I think one of the things that motivates and inspires her is, you know, feeling like she's part of a global movement, uh, particularly of young people who are sick of the denial and bickering and finger pointing and, um, you know, really understand the climate crisis as uh, an issue of, of social justice as well as uh, an environmental issue. Yeah, we're going to have more of the interview with Howie up online as well, Jingwa. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. As Jinghua mentioned there, power rationing is an ongoing problem in parts of China and it has people talking online. After weeks of blackouts, the hashtag power rationing is still trending. One netizen says the price for power rationing is too high. Counting national holidays, I haven't been working for half the month. A lot of unhappy people heading into the colder months, Stan. In response to the crisis, Chinese officials have ordered more than 70 mines in Inner Mongolia to ramp up production. And even Australian coal, which has been unofficially banned for nearly a year, is coming out of bonded storage. But is that a solution? Lara Dong is a senior director in power and renewables at market analyst firm IHS Market, and she joins me now from Beijing. Lara, good of you to be with us. Let's look at how China is dealing with this crisis right now. It's ramping up production. Is that going to be enough? It remains to see whether all these efforts will add up to resolve the issue completely. But by increasing domestic coal supply and also, you know, make adjustment to uh, uh, 
um, the power price will definitely help. But does that mean there's still going to have to be rationing? At the moment, I see all the government policy already includes um, power rationing um, as one of the key measures um, to deal with the current shortage. And does that mean that people are going to have to get used to these power outages? That this is something they're going to have to live with for a while? For this winter, um, I think there's a large probability that uh, some of the power rationing will still happen. But when you refer to people, um, there is a difference between the residential and uh, industrial use of power. Most likely, the residential uh, will not be having to uh, expose to power rationing. Um, it is the industry, manufacturing in particular, uh, will have to uh, get a pain. What's being revealed once again in all of this, isn't it, is that China overwhelmingly still relies on coal for the majority of its power. It is true. And uh, it is not, uh, I don't think it's news even. And the challenge is actually, you know, how to transform this coal dominant system into a clean and low carbon uh, one into the future. Just a final thought from you. Of course, we have the Glasgow Climate Conference looming. Are we expecting or are we likely to see any political shift in China before then? I think the commitment um, by the nation has been, uh, um, you know, made clear through the carbon pledges um, um, a year ago by President Xi. So uh, I, I wouldn't expect that to be changed. Lara, again, thank you for giving us your time. Thanks, Dan. The South Korean Netflix show Squid Game is one of the platform's most watched series. It's become a global pop culture sensation, even in China. That's despite Squid Game not being widely available on the mainland because of Beijing's strict content licensing rules. On Weibo, posts and comments with the hashtag Squid Game have recorded more than 2 billion views. One comment said, Squid Game is really good, but definitely couldn't pass our senses. The hashtag, how will you cross the glass bridge in Squid Game, had 190 million clicks, referring to one of the games the show's characters are forced to play. But for some netizens, that challenge was a bridge too far. This one said, every game in Squid Game is thrilling, but I don't have a strong heart. I might be shaking and falling off the bridge myself. With more than 250 million single people in China and the population ageing at an alarming rate, the focus on love and marriage has never been greater. But not everyone is following the party line to marry and have babies. In fact, many young people using dating apps to find true love are ending up with artificially created mates, AI bots. Samuel Yang has the story. Sounds like the perfect partner, except 22-year-old Chinese international student Siki Lu's boyfriend probably isn't what you'd expect. He's an AI chatbot designed for singles who struggle to find love in China. Siki discovered the chatbot in May last year and developed a relationship with him which she named after favourite Korean actor Lee Dong-wook. The app's creators say there are millions of people engaging with their chatbots every month. Siki 
Ziki is part of a growing trend of young Chinese people flocking to technology solutions to find a companionship, a reflection of the dramatic changes in the way Chinese society views love and marriage. To many Chinese people, especially uh, the older generation, the purpose of dating is uh, for marriage uh, and later for reproduction. Romance and relationships were taboo topics in China for a long time. So the nature of dating really changed dramatically from the 1950s to now. For example, if we look at the 1950s to the 1970s, which is the uh, Maoist period, so romantic love and mate selection were heavily shaped by political ideology and class struggle. But after China opened up in the late 70s, portrayals of love and romance in literature, media, and pop culture, along with the ideas of individualism and materialism, led to the emergence of dating culture. And now, with the young population less concerned with marriage and children than their parents or even their government, dating websites, matchmaking agencies, and reality TV shows have taken off. Chinese dating show If You're the One, where men hope to be chosen for a date, is a global phenomenon, at one stage being watched by an estimated 50 million viewers. And much like in the West, dating apps have become commonplace. So popular. I think first of all is because it's very easy for people to install these dating apps in their mobile phone. And these kind of services really help to tailor the services to their uh, personal needs. They can just uh, set up the criteria uh, for their mate selection uh, in the um, dating apps and that allowed them to quickly find a partner. <laughs> and it's not just heterosexual Chinese benefiting from digital dating. Gay dating apps have opened the door for many in the LGBTIQ community to connect and explore their sexuality and identity. Jacked. Zach Fang lives in Shanghai. He says the normalization of dating culture has been beneficial to LGBTIQ plus people in China. This gives LGBTQI plus community a voice. Despite there are social prejudice people uh, from these communities, they do have their voices heard. Despite the changes in social attitudes, Chinese society still places a lot of pressure on people to marry young. Many Chinese parents are often involved in deciding who their children date. And marriage markets are still common in big cities, where Chinese parents seek suitable partners for their children. After their children graduated, they started to ask, why don't you have a partner and it's time to get married? Singles still have a rather negative image in Chinese society. Bachelors are referred to as bear branches, while leftover woman is a derogatory term for single women over 27. Xiao Yan Bi works in the film industry in Beijing. She says she rushed into a relationship before turning 30 as she was desperate to get married and wanted to avoid the label. The relationship eventually fizzled. For Siki, her virtual boyfriend isn't the end game. She's still hopeful that someone real will enter her life, but her virtual boyfriend will do for now. 
，我觉得陪伴吧，更多的是陪伴，更像是他就在那里面默默的陪着你。A thaw in U.S.-China relations is continuing, with the two superpowers agreeing, in principle, for their presidents to hold a virtual meeting before the end of the year. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and China's top diplomat Yang Jiechi held talks in Switzerland last week. China's state news agency Xinhua said the two sides had a candid and in-depth exchange of views. Yang Jiechi is quoted as saying, "China attaches importance to the positive remarks on China-U.S. relations." Made recently by U.S. President Joe Biden, and China has noticed that the U.S. side said it is not seeking a new Cold War. The renewed engagement comes after President Biden held a call with President Xi in September, ending a nearly seven-month gap in direct communication between the leaders. But the friendly tone will be tested by the increasingly heated rhetoric around Taiwan. After a record number of incursions into Taiwan's air defence identification zone in recent weeks, the island's president has given a defiant speech at National Day celebrations. President Tsai Ing-wen has vowed to boost the island's defences. Speaking in front of a military parade, she said the Taiwanese people would not bow to pressure. We will continue to strengthen the government's resolve to defend self to ensure that no one can force us. 走向中国所设定的路径，因为中国所设定的路径里头，不会有台湾的自由民主的生活方式。President Tsai also repeated an offer for talks with Beijing if they could meet on the basis of parity. But Beijing has refused to deal with her, calling her a separatist who won't acknowledge Taiwan is part of one China. Her comments came after Chinese President Xi Jinping warned that reunification was inevitable, although he did not mention the use of force. And former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's visit to Taiwan provoked fierce criticism from the Chinese embassy in Canberra. Yes, Stan, an embassy spokesman said Tony Abbott is a failed and pitiful politician and also his recent despicable and insane in performance in Taiwan fully exposed his hideous anti-China features. Mr Abbott met with high-level officials, including the president, but it was his speech to a trade forum which appears to have upset the Chinese government. Australia has no issue with China. We welcome trade, investment and visits just not further hectoring about being the chewing gum on China's boot. Well, Foreign Minister Wu tweeted after their meeting that good mate Tony Abbott knows I have a kangaroo in my heart. Writer Yian Li has lived for more than half of her life in America, but her life in China and the struggle between what she sees as the I versus the we of the two cultures has been an ongoing struggle. Trained as a scientist, Yi Yun changed her mind and became instead an author, earning a MacArthur Grant known as the Genius Grant along the way. But hers has not been an American dream. She struggled with her own severe mental health issues and suicide attempts, as well as tragically losing her son to the same fate. She writes in English and has said in the past she's actively unlearned Chinese as a way of making sense of her life. I spoke with Yi Yun Li. English is not my first language. Chinese is my first language. And I think sometimes when you grow up with a language, when you grow up in a language, you are so immersed by the culture and history. And they sometimes could sort of devour you in the way. You know, when you talk about memory, not everything can be expressed at least in my case, in my mother tongue, you know, not that the memories are not always clear in Chinese to me. And part of the reason, you know, finding the words is using English and just to reconstruct memory or also just reconstruct understanding of the past. It's more than that with you, though, isn't it? It's a process of reinvention, writing and speaking in English. You're putting distance 
between yourself and what are very haunted memories? Yes, a little bit. Yeah, I do. You know, I, I know I have said that I think giving up a language, you know, severing the connection with Chinese, it's almost a suicidal, you know, act. You know, it's more like a linguistic suicide. It's to say, I'm not going to use this set of words to be who I am. And English really, when you talk about reinvention, for me, it is really just redefining myself. Yeah, and how much of what you do is about the inheritance of trauma? I lived in China for a decade, and it is a country with a deeply traumatised history on an epic scale. How much of this is personal and how much of this is the inheritance of trauma as well? Yes, part of it, it's my inheritance, you know, personal inheritance, medical inheritance as talking about mental illness. But part of it is, you know, you have 5,000 years of history on your back and they they do crush you sometimes, or at least they, they have this weight. Every single person with that history, I suppose. It's really interesting to look at your own background um, and you talk about brainwashing of a people, people who are trained to think in a certain way. You were in the army, you had to pledge all of that allegiance and sing all of those patriotic songs, you had to mouth all of those words. How much of that did you actually believe at the time? I would not, you know, I would say personally I did not believe at all. Well, but, you know, you were, you, when you were in that environment, you just had to repeat. I mean, some people probably suffered more from that. I would say I actually suffered a lot from having to say these things. Just partly, it's not my nature to be a parrot. In your novel, The Vagrants, um, you have a phrase that directly relates to that, isn't it? Because you have the main character, Shan, speaking to her father and she says, Baba, doesn't it make you tired to talk about things you don't even believe in. How many people under Xi Jinping are talking about things that they truly don't believe in? That's the other thing when we talk about brainwashing. I think the part of the brainwashing or part of using words that are given to you is you, you stop being careful with words. You repeat the words many times and the words don't have meanings anymore. And I, I am sensitive to words. That's why I feel that, you know, when you say, do people believe in them? They may not even question that now. But I think when you stop asking those questions, language becomes slippery. And yet I know from having lived there that there are things like the century of humiliation that resonate deeply in the Chinese soul. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I think that's the other thing if you look at human nature, we forget joy probably more quickly than we forget pain or suffering or humiliation. And this repeated teaching of humiliation, you know, I, I do think that what you said, that humiliation, that shared suffering, it's in public language all the time. It's repeatedly, and I think it's repeated given to people and, and this history, can, you cannot forget this history. No, it does both things. You know, if you look at, say, Americans may not be so keen about remembering history. Well, in China, it's the opposite. It's, it's, history is never dead. It's always alive. What do you think the future holds for China? Do you see this return of Chinese power as motivated by a sense of grievance, a vengeance, an idea of returning China to the centre of global power? I don't know. I, I think the, the, what I hope for the future is, you know, I do think internet has changed things tremendously for people, for all over the world, right? For, for better, for worse. But I do think, and for one reason, I think like internet makes it really hard to close the border, to close the ideological gate. You know, when we grew up, there was no connection to the outside world. And now the outside world is there all the time. You just want to, I want to hope the younger generation, when they see the world more, when they have, you know, exposure to other countries, maybe it's going to be I think maybe China is going to change a little in the next 50 years. Yian, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me.
And before we go, while China's wealthy are well known to head offshore to gamble in the world's casinos, it's a definite no as far as most Chinese people go. And that's all we have on this week's show. Next week, life in China when you're living with a disability. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.